Good evening. You're very welcome to this, our 10th episode of Centre Ground. And tonight, the spotlight is on the unbroken chain of state abuse of birth mothers and their children. But before we begin our programme, I'd just like to put a call out for anybody who has videography or editing skills. Please go to the Irish Inquiry website and there's a, a drop down box and um, help us and you can enter your details there. A big thank you to Stephen and his team at the Irish Inquiry who are making this live stream possible. And so to begin, my guests tonight are David Kinsler, who is a survivor of a mother and baby home. Later on, I will have a pre-recorded interview with Mary, a mother whose baby was taken in the last year from by Tusla. Then I'll be chatting to Barbara Scanlon. Barbara is the spokesperson for ABC, the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice. And finally, as always, in the second half of the programme, we have a panel discussion and that's chaired by Dr. Peter Dunn. David Kinsler is a survivor of a mother and baby home. He has campaigned for many, many years on the issue, and he's here now tonight to chat to us about his life story. You're very welcome to Centre Ground, David. Thanks a lot, Anne. It's delighted to be on the show. Delighted to be here with you all. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we're just having a little technical difficulty here. I think we have lost uh, your image there, uh, David. So um, maybe um, can we we don't have you yet. Um, maybe, maybe if David if, can click the image on us, Anna. Uh, Stephen, can David click his, his ca just a little camera icon? There is a difficulty there. Um, David, are you still with us? I'm still, I'm still here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're having difficulty with your camera. Um, this is what this is um, a technical hitch now, and we're going out live. But um, um, d d Stephen, this is just a suggestion. Do you want to play the pre-recorded interview with Mary until we sort out the issue with the camera? Yeah, we'll do that, Anna. OK, we'll play that now. Yes. So before we um, we play that um, <coughs> pre-recorded interview with Mary, just a little background information. Mary um, is a professional lady, very well educated. She was in a long term relationship with her boyfriend. Sadly, that relationship came to an end. And sometime after that, Mary discovered that she was pregnant. She tells her story from this point. It was an unexpected pregnancy, and I think my doctor would have contacted them initially, um, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. You know, uh, I, I, I didn't stay with my partner. Um, we had we had broken up at that stage, and I, I kind of found out about maybe a month and a half later. So I would have said once all this to my doctor. You know, um, and I just had no idea how naive I was, really. And um, um, then I, I was signed up to do the domino project, which I was kind of happy about. Mary now tells me how she went to a and &E with a very severe pain in her back a month before her baby was due. They checked her out. And when she wasn't in labour, they sent her home and she continued to suffer from very severe backache. She was brought in a week before her due date to be induced. Like I, one of the things that I had a slip disc then, so I was in labour for 25 hours with a slip disc and no one recognised it. And I had been in the emergency a month prior, but they just checked the baby, they didn't actually check, them, check me. So I am... Um, so they, um, I hadn't planned on getting an epidural, 
It was the last thing I wanted really to do because I was in there for so long. I was very, I got worried, you know. And because I felt like the baby was, was struggling for too long, you know what I mean? And um, um, I, I knew right, there was something that was wrong with my back and I couldn't. Uh, I was telling them that there was something wrong, but they wouldn't listen, you know. They okay. kept kind of saying, well, that's just the pain of the birth or whatever. And then when I... Um, and then after the work, I kept passing out because I um because I was traumatized so from the work. <laughs> I kept passing out and uh, I couldn't stay awake for long, and I needed to take a bed. And then they said that I couldn't take care of her, and they wanted to court order take care of her. But I, you know, I um. Looking back now, they kept um, assessing me psychiatrically, saying that there was something wrong with me, and they had every psychiatrist in the top of me, and I just felt completely battered and golden by them, you know. And they were just assessing my whole family history and everything, and I just felt it was a bit much, and looking back now, I realized how much it was physically, it was more physical than anything, you know. The ordeal of giving it was like they weren't recognizing what I was trying to tell them, you know. Having endured 25 hours of labor with what was later discovered to be a slipped disc, Mary was in agony after the birth, and her anxieties were put down as mental illness. Tusla became involved, they sought an emergency care order and the baby was taken into care for a week before Mary and her baby were sent to a mother and baby home. I was with her for about a week, for the first week, and then they put her in care for a week, and then I was coerced into going to So I, um, I uh, was in for three months, and all that time I still had to sit this, and I complained every day about my back. And, um... I wasn't allowed to breastfeed her too. That was really upsetting for me because they wouldn't bring in the breast pump to me early, you know. And because I, I they said that they were, they were all being used. And, but by the time then they, they had the breast pump became available, it was kind of too late because they were panicking about feeding her and they started to give her the bottle feed. And then when I was in the I tried to breastfeed her again and they wouldn't let me because they wanted me regimented into the 95 thing in their scheduling. And I struggled with that a lot. I, didn't, I had a big problem with that because I wasn't allowed to feed her and you have to be relaxed to be able to breastfeed. Like, you know, you can't be kind of on people's back and call 24-7. Do you know what I mean? You have to be able to relax with your baby and, and bond with your baby to be able to breastfeed properly, for the milk to flow properly without a fuss, but they were kind of pushing me to do it on an agenda, you know, and and I got basically bullied out of doing it, like, you know, when I had the milk and everything, but it was just, it was um, so arduous with everything that was going on, and on top of the, the, the back pain and the sickness, on top of that, you know, and I'd say every day I complained about it. And still, they kept telling me that it was mental illness, mental illness, and that I was narcissistic and all this stuff. But they would never listen to me to say that, I, you know, they would never... I, and then when I when I started to, to try to go to the osteopath, they would... They, I only had four hours off a week, and I couldn't squeeze. I couldn't arrange it for, for it to get out, you know? So, and, um, it was just a huge ordeal. Like, I couldn't get out to go to the doctor and uh, everything in my body was telling me to go, you know. And then um, I left, when I left, she went back into care because I didn't want to finish it because it, did, it wasn't right for me to be there. It's like I had this strong, really strong intuition. There was something wrong with me, you know, physically. And like, I couldn't be there, it, you know, I felt... I had to, I had to kind of rupture what was going on because I couldn't be there anymore, you know? It was just too strict and I didn't feel like I was being listened to. In the mother and baby home, Mary was discouraged from breastfeeding her baby. She complained of being in agonizing pain with her back, but it was dismissed as mental health problems. She was allowed out weekly for four hours 
and during that time she was unable to get medical attention. Eventually, after three months, she could take no more. She left and her baby was taken into care. The first time they took the emergency court order, I was crying in the foyer of, of the courthouse for five hours waiting for hearing. Mary now tells me about her weekly access to her baby. Just one hour. I see her once a week now. I had a lot of problems with them at the start. Again, they weren't listening to me. They constantly had their own agenda. At Christmas, I, I went uh, last year, I went to my doctor and I was very upset about everything. And I, I was just howling, howling inside my office. I told him I was in a lot of pain. And he, he wouldn't even examine me physically. Like he kept saying, oh, you're mentally ill, you're mentally ill. But they seem to think that your self-esteem is, is distinguished from your daughter. And they seem to think that your self-esteem is separate from your daughter. And I don't understand that at all. He didn't help me. He said I wasn't allowed to cry in public. He said I wasn't allowed to cry. I shouldn't be crying, he said. I gave out to me for being upset over my daughter. And then I left that day and I said I'll never check in that man's door again because of the way he treated me. Free at last from the mother and baby home, Mary managed to meet with an osteopath that she had seen a few years previously, and he diagnosed her as having a slipped disc. And I, I went to see a follow up an old osteopath that I went to a couple of years back when I had an injury, and I was trying to follow up to get his number again. And by the time I got it, COVID had started. And I couldn't, I couldn't get an appointment with him because the lockdown had, had taken place and I had to wait another three months to get an get a appointment with him. And when I finally did, he said that I had slipped this in my upper back and my lower back. And uh, I, had to get, I had to come back again for a second session after two weeks because he said it was there for so long that it would pop out again, you know. You've been listening there to Mary and the most painful story of how her baby came to be taken from her by Tusla. That is a shortened version of a much longer interview that she did with me. At times she broke down um, and I have to say that I broke down with her just so incredibly painful. She turned her camera on her bedroom from where I spoke to her and uh, her baby's cot is alongside her bed. She's all the baby's toys and clothes that she had bought before the birth lined up. And as she said to me um, when she contacted me last year, um, she had no baby and a fridge full of breast milk absolutely appalling um, and the issues raised by Mary's interview I'll be taking up later on in the programme with Barbara Scanlon, the spokesperson for the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice, who support mothers like Mary. Sadly, um, Mary's story is just the latest saga in our really very, very troubled past. Um, the mother and baby home scandal is been dominating news headlines for for a number of weeks now. And here to chat to me is one of the survivors of a mother and baby home. David, once again, you're very welcome to Centre Ground. And sorry about that technical hitch that we had earlier on in the programme. Thanks I, a lot, Anne, and everybody for having me on. David, tell me a little bit about how you came to be born in a mother and baby home. Um, um, well, I can explain that in two words, illegitimate child. Um, and them two words are portrayed uh, on the top of my uh, entry uh, certificate into St. Patrick's Navan Road, uh, where it says, uh, entry number 1629 and then it has 
legitimate or illegitimate, and it has a highlight, uh, has a legitimate cross and illegitimate uh, is there in black and white. So they were the purpose uh, um, under that illegitimate uh, that my my birth mother, Lord Rester, uh, and the four years I had to endure there myself. And do you have any memories um, of being in the mother and baby home until you were four? It's not a memories, um, where maybe from the um, maybe between the age of three and um, I I went through a a, a steel a steel cart and and fingers uh, for someone to pick me up and. Uh, echo noises and uh, 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 walking up and down corridor, um, a sort of a neck type of uh, atmosphere, like an eerie type of a uh, uh, kind of a, a cold, a chorus in a sense. And um, I was there for four years, as I say. I was also, uh, I also, um, uh, um, there on one time, and uh, and I, I find another need in December nineteen. Four days later, I have a certificate I'm lying from fair in great danger of death. Um, so, and unfortunately, we'll have to come back to it. David, I, I think we're going to have to interrupt that interview because we're having difficulties with the. Um, with the connection there, I, I don't think we can actually hear what you're saying to us. Stephen, can you come in right, there? Right. Is it is it just just can you come in there, Stephen? Is it true that um, the sound isn't coming through? Yeah, no, we, we can't. We'll have to come back to that another day, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid, David, we're going to have to abandon the interview. And I'm really sorry about that. The Wi-Fi connection is so poor, we can't actually hear what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay. We'll arrange that for I, another day, Anna. Yes, I, I think uh, w w we will come back to you in, uh, at another time, um, David. Um, and, and my okay. apologies for that. Okay. okay. Um, sorry about okay, that. Okay, I understand. This, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I suppose these are um, the difficulties associated with uh, going out live. Um, but un unfortunately, um, we didn't get to hear David's story. David was going to tell me about uh, uh, growing up in the mother and baby home until he was four years old. And then as a young man, he went searching for his birth mother. Um, he had huge difficulties then trying to trying to track her down. And nowadays, he is a tireless campaigner on the whole issue of um, making the mother and baby home records available and so that the survivors can have access to their records and, I suppose, bring a little bit of closure to what they're going through. Now, um, I suppose since 2018, uh, mothers started contacting me, telling me the stories of the difficulties that they were having with Tusla. Now, to be honest, I had never heard of Tusla. And um, the stories uh, that I was hearing were absolutely really, really appalling. Um, and so in June 2019, I brought a number of these mothers together in Athlone. And with the help of Deputy Anne Rabbit, who was the Fianna Fáil spokesperson on children at the time, we set up the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice. I then set about writing a 13,000 page report, a 13,000 word report, 
which I duly sent to every member of the 32nd Dáil. Uh, the report it was called the Triad Rules, Tusla, the Family Law Courts and the Garda Shikona. In that report, I documented the abuses of birth mothers um, at the hands of, mainly at the hands of Tusla. And I said that if the present generation don't do something about what is happening to birth mothers and their children, we will not be forgiven. You know, we, we sort of forgive past generations uh, slightly on the grounds that they didn't know what was happening. But we actually know what is happening. And indeed, uh, the then um, uh, opposition spokesperson, or, or the, the, the leader of the opposition, Michal Martin, wrote to Minister Sapona asking her, uh, had she received the report and um, uh, asked her a number of questions about it. That was in September 2019. She acknowledged receiving the report and she referred to a number of the recommendations made in the report in her written answer to um, Michal Martin. The bottom line now is that all of the TDs in the Dáil have been informed and they are aware of what is actually happening to birth mothers and their children. And the question is, what are they going to do about it? I'm going to speak now to Barbara Scanlon, who is uh, the spokesperson for the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaign for Justice. Barbara, you're very welcome to Centre Crown. Anna, thank you for having me. Um, Barbara, we watched th that uh, pre-recorded interview with Mary, and uh, I suppose there's several issues raised by that interview. First of all, she was um, a woman who was pregnant and she didn't have the support of her of, um, of her partner and she didn't have family support that left her very vulnerable. When her baby was born, there was the issues around breastfeeding. Uh, there's the ongoing issue of access to her baby. Are, are these issues common to the other mothers that you're dealing with in the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice? Yes, Anna, Mary's story rings every day on the phone. Um, I suppose it, it's very, very sad, harrowing to listen to. And I suppose the very sad thing is if you listen to Mary's story, she's very alone. Um, from listening to that, no legal representation, had just broken up with her partner. Um, I don't know, does she have family to support her? With Tusla seem to pick on single parents single parents that are on their own, that have no support, um, and they coerce them. They coerce them either to sign their children into voluntary care, or if they don't do that, they go to court and get an emergency care order. Now, the other thing is, you know, Tusla, breast is best, they'll tell you. Well, the mothers are telling me at all costs, they've never been allowed to breastfeed their kids which is absolutely appalling. And yes, Annie, you were right when you said it years ago, years ago when this happened in the mother and baby homes, people claimed ignorance. But everybody knows what's happening now. But nobody's willing to stand up and do the right thing. You know, and the TDs and the Dáil are telling everybody last week, you know, we won't give the files of, we, we shouldn't give the files of the mother and baby homes to Tusla, but they're allowed to look after the children of Ireland. That doesn't make sense. That That's a very interesting point, Barbara. Yes, there was a huge furore created about handing over files to Tusla. Uh, uh, Catherine Connolly and Kathleen Funchen, Holly Kearns, outstanding in their uh, contribution to the whole issue of the mother and baby homes. And it was repeated over and over that the files shouldn't be handed over to Tusla, that it was a completely discredited body. And as you say there, Barbara, yes, um, there isn't an outcry about the children of the nation being under the care of Tusla, which is really, really scary. Tell me a little bit about the um, reunification plans that um, mothers have. OK, so first of all, uh, any child that's in care, it's law that they have a reunification plan. 
um, and the judges are telling the mothers that every child should have one. So for the children that do have one, um, and for them to come home to their mothers, it's like a box ticking exercise. They will give the mother a list of stuff they have to do. And unfortunately, what happens is when they're on the last week, two things happen. Either they get a new re reunification plan or the second thing is a new social worker will arrive. And when a new social worker arrives, it really, she goes back to the start to the case and it throws the reunification plan back by months. A lot of children in care don't have a reunification plan. So for these mothers, even though they're putting in the work, they're doing everything they're asked, they're still on and not getting their children home. I know that in recent days um, I've been speaking about the whole issue of um, mother and baby homes and quite a number of people are actually surprised to discover that the mother and baby homes never went away. They're very much with us. They're very much with us, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a couple, isn't there, in Ireland? Vesper probably would be the biggest one in Cork. Um, yes. And there's another one in Dublin. And and lots of mothers will go to these mother and baby homes. Obviously, a social worker, Tusla, need to refer you there. You go to your mother, the mother and baby home. You'll do lots of courses. And for some mothers, they do get to see, keep their kids. Um, and Vesper, I have to say, do some amazing work. Absolutely do some amazing work. But for some mothers, that really want to go to mother and baby homes and beg and plead, they just won't give them a referral. So it's very dependent on who your social worker is. And the other thing that we have discovered recently is that Tusla are actually sending uh, mothers and their children outside of the jurisdiction to mother and baby homes in the UK. Yes. There's the Northern Ireland and to the UK, yes which is quite surprising. Um, Barbara, tell me a little bit about the complaints procedure uh, that mothers can avail of if they have difficulties with Tussler or their social workers. So the complaints procedure that Tussler has set up is called Tell Us. Uh, and it is very fitting and it's a great word, Tell Us, because you put in your complaint and when it goes into Tell Us, it goes back to the particular person have complained about for them to deal with it. So if it's a social worker, the complaint goes right back to the social worker to deal with it. So unfortunately, what happens is if a mother complains about a social worker, it can be anything. Her access immediately is cut. The social worker will know that she has complained. Her access is cut. Um, and, and just absolutely, it's shocking. And to be honest, for us, it's the only, and I have to say this, that I've ever come across that if you fail miserably in your job and you do the worst of things, you actually get promoted. So what happened to the people in the Grace case? What happened to the people with Morris McCabe? They've all been promoted in Tusla. No other organisation will do that. And that's the organisation that are looking after the children of Ireland. They need to be closed, Anna. Yes, it's... it's um... I suppose, um, a really, really, really difficult issue. And I, I suppose the thing that goes very deep into my heart is that when um, mothers have their babies taken from them, there's absolutely no supports for them. We learned recently through a question uh, that uh, Deputy Kathleen Funchen, um placed with the Minister for Children, we learned that 123 children under the age of one years old were removed from their mothers last year in 2019. And Tusla will actually say that they are there to support, uh, you know, the, the welfare of the child, but there's actually nobody there to support the welfare of the mother. And we know from talking to mothers in the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice that when uh, Tusla go into court and get that emergency care order to remove the mother, to remove the baby from the mother when they're in the maternity hospital, the mother is then discharged and there is absolutely no support for that grieving mother. Um, and we see it there in the case of Mary. Um, 
it's um, I, uh, her baby now is is well over a year old, and there is absolutely no supports for her. She's been gaslit. She was gaslit in the hospital when she complained about the pain in her back. Um, she was gaslit in the mother and baby home, and she was told that she had psychiatric and mental illnesses. Uh, when she went to her doctor, then when she left the mother and baby home, he too told her that she was mentally ill. So it's um, it's re it's really, really, really appalling that we're now in the 21st century and babies are being removed from mothers in the same way as they were in the days of old. Um, I suppose all the spotlight has been on the nuns and there has been no spotlight put on the state because what happened in the mother and baby homes couldn't actually happen without the agencies of the state also being involved. And the same thing is happening today. The, 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 the same agents of the state, the Gardaí, the, fa the family law courts, and what is now Trust, the, 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 the Child and Family Agency, are involved in this state abuse. But uh, no supports whatsoever for the mothers, and I'm sure no supports either for the children that are traumatised by being separated from their mothers. Would you like to comment on that, Barbara? Yeah, I, ju I just feel these mothers are very alone. Um, you know, I, I don't understand how to separate mothers from their children. Why can't they put supports in place? Why can't they put community supports in place? And, and you know, and when they do separate them, they give them one hour a week access. Sure, no parent could keep a bond with a child one hour a week. That's totally unacceptable. And, you know, I, I just I really don't understand what they're trying to do here. They're supposed to it's supposed to be, yes, you know, for the best of the child. But to see your parent for one hour a week and that's totally unacceptable. It's, you know, things really need to change. And I do believe the people of Ireland need to stand up. It's going on with years, the mother and baby homes many, many years ago, and nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. And in another hundred years, we'll be roaring about the files of these mothers. It's too late. Things need to change now. OK, so that is a very good point on which to end. Um, just to repeat it, you're saying that if we don't do something about what is actually happening now in years to come, we'll be having a similar conversation that we're having around the historic abuse of birth mothers and their children in the mother and baby homes. Thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us tonight. And now, um, Dr. Peter Dunn is going to introduce the hot topic of the week. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Anna. Uh, how are you doing? Um, and uh, thanks to yourself and thanks also as well to, to Stephen. Um, I have to say in, in the time I've been here uh, as, as moderator, I mean, generally the subject matter that we cover is, is controversial, quite obviously. And um, quite harrowing, but um, I mean, how to follow that, um, that's that's quite quite stunning, I have to say. Um, a number of observations again, um, you know, I do this, people that know me tell me I need to be a better listener. So, you know, in listening to, to our guests, some things strike me just by way of observation. I think what we're really dealing with here is uh, a story of institutional power uh, set against vulnerable individuals. So there's a complete imbalance and asymmetry, a, a David and Goliath, as it were. So that's a massive issue. The other thing that really struck me, um, I have to be honest, uh, when David was talking about, you know, the, that, that dull sort of sterile bureaucracy and how on the form legitimate was crossed out and he was, he was termed illegitimate. And I have to say, I find that quite difficult to deal with, that somebody could actually look at a child, a newborn baby, and consider them as illegitimate. So immediately, I mean, I don't understand the mindset that's come up with that, that language because uh, words are weapons. And illegitimate is a powerful uh, dehumanizing word. It's cruel, it's cold, it's inhuman. So I think, you know, if, if anything, hopefully, We've we've moved on from from that very dark past. But then having heard tonight's stories, 
one really has to wonder, have we? Um, speaking of the perils of, of um, live broadcasts, I, I did uh, happen to very briefly catch last Friday night's Late Late Show, and uh, because normally I don't tune in, I have to be honest, uh, Ryan Tuberty said that in relation to the mother and baby homes, that silence was the enemy, and he's right. He's, he is right to, to give him his due. But silence isn't the only enemy, because when we talk, what we say is very important. Words are important. Words can be weapons. Um, and it's important to deal in facts, all of the facts, because otherwise, rather than silence, uh, what we have merely is background noise. And saying the wrong thing can be just as damaging as silence. And um, also in terms of considering both sides of, of, of an argument. Uh, because otherwise, again, we merely engage in misdirection, which is the handmaiden of silence. Um, and that can be used to obstruct the truth and a general understanding of reality. And I'm actually minded of that, that church scene in the, the movie The Field, uh, where the young parish priest played by Sean McGinley um, chides the congregation about their silence, uh, the kind of silence that protects a murderer, implying their complicity in the crime. And silence can protect all sorts of crimes and all sorts of abuses. And bearing all that in mind, this week's hot topic question is, has the ceiling of the state files about the mother and baby homes denied the survivors the chance to heal? So, Barbara, um, just to um, pass that question over to you to begin with, do you think that sealing up the um, mother and baby home files would actually prevent survivors from healing? I think so, Anna, yes. I do think so. Now, I suppose you're dealing every day with mothers and we have what's called the in-camera rule in the family law courts. Tell our viewers a little bit about that. So what the in-camera rule is, obviously, when you go to court, um, your case is in camera and you can't discuss your case with anybody. If you do, um, it, you can be put into jail. Isn't that right, Anna? Or for a journalist, if a journalist breaks yes. it, there's a, a 50,000 euro fine um, or a jail sentence. But for a mother, it would be she could serve time in prison. So she can't discuss any part of her case. So this is used, the in camera rule is used as a very powerful weapon then to to, to silence mothers. And now I know that in the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice, that, the, the, you know, it's very, very strict that mothers are never allowed to reveal themselves because in revealing themselves, they reveal their children. And it leaves a digital footprint as that the children will have to live with long after their parents are gone. It can affect their job opportunities and affect them for life, really. So, in, in that respect and in that regard, the in-camera rule is very, very good. It's there to protect children from their life story, as it were, being trashed about. Um, but it's a double-edged sword. It has the effect then of terrorising mothers. It has the effect of terrorising them, but it also has the effect of isolating them. Um, so, it, you know, it's very hard for these mothers to get support and sometimes to get the help they need without without disclosing certain parts to their story. Um, but with the in-camera rule, they can't do that. So they're very much on their own and very much isolated. So, P Peter, the um, recent legislation that was passed to seal the uh, mother and baby home files for 30 years and hand over other files to Trusla created a huge Ferrari. Uh, close on 200,000 people have now signed a petition calling for repeal of, uh, of that legislation to seal the files. I think um, Holly Kern this afternoon seemed to get new information from the Taoiseach. Maybe we'll have a look at uh, proceedings in the Dáil this afternoon uh, when Holly Kearns questioned the Taoiseach. I think 
Stephen, my Stephen, do you have that video clip, Stephen? OK, Deputy Holly Kearns, please. Thanks, Karen Corla. Uh, Taoiseach, your government's recent acknowledgement of people's right uh, to their own information based on personal data access requests is so welcome. Um, I and many others presume that this right applies not just to the data from the Mother and Baby Homes Commission, but also for data from the Ryan Report and the McAleese archives. Um, they were sealed away a very long time ago. Um, can you please clarify that all survivors of institutional abuse will be able to access their own personal data? Thank you. Could I say at the outset that um, my own view is that GDPR applies uh, in terms of access to personal data? Uh, and um, that's the view of the Attorney General uh, as, as well. Um, I would have been involved in establishing the Rhine Commission, which was then the Lafoy Commission, and I would have opened up all the files to historians at the time and gave them access as Minister for Education at the time. Um, I know I'm just going to come to that, so I have no interest in any records you know, being put into some vault and left there for a long time that no one has access to. Um, so uh, what we've decided to do as a government is to, both in the context of industrial schools, in the context of Magdalene laundries and in the context of modern baby homes, is to have a proper national centre where these archives will be held, but not just an archival centre, but also that we try and be creative and this is where the story will be told about dark chapters of our past. Now there are clearly, there will be legal issues and I think the Expansion of GDPR is an interesting area and, and making sure we affirm the rights of people to access their own personal data, uh, which is a European Thank you, legal Time is up. Uh, requirement now and one that should be adhered to. Solidarity. Okay, I noticed that uh, David Kinsler is still with us. So, Stephen, maybe if you might just uh, unmute the mic for David. We'll just see if his internet connection has improved, that we can hear him. Um, David Just, Kinsella is. David will have to unmute it himself. Is yeah. one of the. Uh, David, you also. D does David have his microphone on mute as well? David, can you unmute your mic? So, if you can unmute your mic, David. I think that's it now, is it? Yes, that sounds a lot better. I, I, I think, David, um, you might have been able to hear what the Taoiseach was saying there, that he's giving yeah, an like insurance. Yes, yeah. And uh, what's your response to that? Um, my response, is, uh, I suppose, is like, you know, that, that um, those who wish to, ha to have their files uh, uh, reachable uh, in, in public or in archives, like, you know, uh, it has to be re uh, reachable, like, you know, if you know, if if for example, if if my uh, if my granddaughter wanted to kind of uh, hear about her, her granddad's background, uh, what was a mother and baby home, and you know that 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 history is there for whoever, whatever survivor or family relative uh, wishes to see it, it. It should be there. You know that that our voices have been heard and and spoken. That that. Uh, that we're, we're, we are no longer silent. Right. Uh, David, the, the sound is quite good now. So maybe I'm, I might just have a little chat with you. Um, so once again, you were telling me at the start of the programme that you were born in a mother and baby home. And the reason for that was that your mother wasn't married. Exactly, uh, uh, and uh, in, in, as I said, in, in the two words, the two words that are across my entry record, uh, illegitimate child, uh, illegitimate child number one six two nine, you know. So, so um, that was the sort of uh, the way you know I as a, a, a as as an unborn infant. Um, even when my mother went, went into the home, obviously uh, I, I was in her womb, waiting to waiting waiting to meet the earth, you know, uh, what the world was going to throw in front of me. But uh, sadly, uh, I, I know my mother said, birth mother said with me for for the nine months and maybe maybe a month or so after us. Uh, but I remained there for a, for a further three years there on, where they 
they casted my mother across the waters to Britain as they did with a lot of the mothers coming from St. Patrick's mother and baby home. Um, never to see her again. And, and, and you mentioned Dan, uh, could I recall uh, uh, from the, you know aspects of a child, like you know, well maybe from three and and four, the, the, the hollowness and that. But I do remember some, some, you know, my mother touching my face to some sort, uh, a tender fingers running uh, on my face. Uh, that I, I can recall, but but sadly I I, I never uh, I never got to see her. Um, I'll never have the have the opportunity in 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 in, in a lifetime uh, what it's like to sit at a table with with my birth mother and siblings. I, I'll never have that opportunity now whatsoever in a lifetime. You know? While on the other hand, I, I'm glad that in a sense that I was adopted at four because had I not been. I would have gone on from there to St. Josephine's or one of the industrial schools to a more uh, a more horrendous life. Like, you know, we know what industrial school survivors went through. Um, but still, I, I had the, 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 uh, the, the, the sort of um, the pearls that lie through at me at an early age uh, when I started looking for my birth mother Anne at the age of 17. Uh, the Eastern Health Board, as they were known in before the HSE, wouldn't entertain me at all until I was 18. And uh, a social worker got in touch with me by letter, and uh, all she told me what really was, like, you know, that, that, that that's, uh, all we know is that your mum said with you for approximately a year, and then she went to England. Uh, you know, whereas I know that, 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 that she was casted across the waters to England. Uh, and... Uh, I was never to see her again, sadly. Um, and that put me in a, a downhill roller coaster, you know, towards the uh, the stepping stones towards towards abuse uh, into into the whole chronology of uh, alcoholism at a young age. And um, by the time I was nineteen, I, I, I was in a, a detox unit, a psychiatric unit, uh, hospital six St James was in there detoxing, and. Um, Again, when I was 22, 23 years of age, I ended up in there again uh, in a bad way with alcoholism and drugs. Uh, but the alcohol and, and substance abuse was, was a coping me- mechanism for me to cope with that emotion. You know, uh, that genetic bewilderment I was going through at a very young age, you know, between the age of 17 to, to 24. Uh, and... and even though I knew at the age of twelve, Anne, that I was adopted, yeah. that was the age that 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 uh, my adopted mother, Lord Rester, as well, told me one day when I came in from school, and um, you know the way all the little boys are making their confirmation next week, uh, and we've been in touch with the priest, and you won't you won't be able to will not be able to make your confirmation with the other lads because. We actually adopted you, David. Uh, your dad and I, we adopted you from a, a mother and baby home. Uh, that didn't make much sense to me, obviously, at 12. But but, but I remember saying to myself, um, that's where I couldn't grasp. I knew something wasn't right. And when she further explained, like, you know, that I was very sick in the mother and baby home and I was anointed and confirmed uh, and gra- that I nearly died, and the certificate uh, does kind of have a, I have an actual confirmation certificate from the baby, the mother and baby home when I was anointed. So I presume under Catholic law, once you make, once you're anointed and confirmed that you've made your confirmation, like you know whether that was true, in danger of death or going to, going up to the altar with the lads, and as, as I probably much would have preferred to do, but. Uh, that's an, opp- an opportunity I lost out on. Uh, but I'm coming back to, to searching for my mum uh, because I had no answers. Like you know, at that, at that age, I uh, and genetic be- bewilderment, I I just tumbled into the role, the draws of uh, chronic alcoholism and substance abuse. Uh, thankfully, I went in, uh, after a few detoxes uh, and rehab. I, I went into uh, a rehab for nine weeks, and th- thankfully, I haven't drank or t- taken substance in 35 years. You know, that gave That's me superb. That's, That's giving me great su- strength now to talk about things like, you know. That's superb news. Tell me a little bit about 
the obstacles that were put in your way when you tried to find out who your birth mother was? Um, the obstacle uh, put me away was um, no, uh, no data, uh, uh, no, no information, uh, particularly at, at the time of the Eastern Health Board, you know, um, and it was only, uh, you know, uh, going through that gen genetic bewilderment and what did my mother look like and, and everything like, you know, and it's only when the uh, uh, as bad as the Eastern Health Board were, uh, and uh, as bad as the HSE can be as well now in modern time, uh, I was lucky and I, I was highly lucky to be given a dedicated social worker in 2004, 2004 who, who, uh, who kind of uh, resumed my search uh, as to who I am and who my birth mother was. And... Um, I remember getting a phone call offer uh, a year later, so it, it took nearly a year to track down that. that uh, um, I had four siblings living in London, and but sadly that my birth mother had died in in, in 1987 in Basingstoke, London. And ironically, in 1986 we were going, we were coming out of, of another sort of recession uh, here in Ireland back in the 80s, and. I was actually walking in London, uh, London Victoria and British Rail in the stores then. And so had I had I been given the information from the Eastern Health Board at that time, say, um, I was only 20 minutes away in the tube where I wasn't to know, you know. And, and sadly, um, I never got to see my mother in person. Um, but I, I found a resting place, thank God, you know, uh, in Basingstoke. And... I've met one of my siblings, <coughs> um, which I'll always be grateful for taking a flight off from London over here to see me. And uh, uh, she was a middle sibling of four, like you know. And uh, um, I've kind of learned in uh, through family systems how to be like you know that a middle sibling is the always the most curious that will go out of their way to find out something, like you know. And uh, so I was delighted to meet Emma that that time uh, back in 2005, and uh, when she walked out of the lift in the in the Great Southern Hotel in Dublin Airport, where, where I did meet her that time, um, through the social worker, uh, I recognised her immediately amongst the, the, a vast amount of people that were coming and going through the the, the lobby. Uh, um, she was the image of me. She was the image of my youngest daughter, and. Uh, that's how I recognised her straight away without without uh, having to have an introduction, so to say. Um, she gave me a photograph of my mum, who, who, who's the, the image of me, actually. Like, you know, uh, anyone that sees the photograph alongside myself and, and, and a picture of me, Bert, mother, Lord, rest her, uh, identical nearly, like, you know, uh, even though she's a woman, like, you know, but the features are very much there. So I'll always be thankful for, for, for that, like, you know, but... Uh, Sadly, I had to face rejection again, like, you know, and lucky enough, I, I had gone through that sort of uh, harsh rehab uh, back in the in the old Rutland Centre, uh, which did me all the good, like, you know, uh, and back in 1985, uh, and uh, had I not done that rehab, I, I don't know what way I would have coped uh, with the rejection again of, of not being... Uh, uh, um, Emma kind of got caught between a rock and a hard place uh, with the other siblings, like you know, and because uh, my mum took my existence to the grave, and uh, as a lot of mo birth mums did, sadly, like you know, and, and uh, um, to this day, they still can't, my siblings still can't fathom my existence uh, uh, whatsoever, and being the eldest, uh, the eldest uh, of the family, like you know, so. Uh, but my door is always open. That's all I can do there, Anna. Like, you know, my door is always yes. open. And, uh, you know. well, D David, um, it's a most harrowing story. And I want to thank you most, most sincerely for sharing it. And I suppose for any mothers who are looking in tonight and their children are now in uh, state care, I think they can get great hope from your, and the way you have spoken with such love and affection for your birth mother, 
And while the state may have separated you, they were not able to break that bond of love that exists oh, between no. a mother and their child. It just transcends all evil. So thank you so much, David, for sharing your Lovely story. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, I go back to you now, Peter. Um, maybe you might be able to pull together what we have been saying tonight on the program. Yes, indeed, Anna. And um, no, it was it was a relief to be able to hear um, David's story. And you know, I I have to say, it strikes me that um, it's an inspirational story. And you know, just to maybe draw some hope from all this, I think this is a very dark part of our past. Um, and, you know, sometimes we look at the, the darker aspects of human nature, but I think there are heroes in this story. And I think all of the adoptive parents, you know, with whom many of the survivors actually found very warm, loving homes, I think they should be, you know, very much, uh, you know, looked up to and uh, we, we really should cherish those people. Um, the other thing, just in terms of what David was saying about his story of, of um, you know, alcoholism and addiction, I think many unfortunate survivors of the mother and baby homes, um, you know, they'll have been traumatized at a very young age. But equally, something that struck me earlier on, and I've just recalled, that the denial of actually of breastfeeding, really, um, I, I would suspect that uh, if, if one were to look into that, that that will actually have lifelong health implications as well. So really, you know, right across the board, these people were really treated shamefully in many, many ways. Just to tie it all up then, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the sealing of these files, and why, why does this matter? Why is this important? And really it's important because we need to get meaningful knowledge. We need a model of reality of what happened. Um, and if knowledge is power, um, does the sealing of those state files relating to the mother and baby homes then, does that represent a denial of information and thus knowledge to the survivors primarily, but, but also to the public at large? Now, why do I say that? And why do I imply that that's important? Um, and I say that because releasing the files and the information that they contain helps to give us appreciate an appreciation of not just what happened, but of the why of it and of the how of what happened. And that enables um, a sort of societal self-examination and an introspection. Um, uh, and that may be the only way that may offer some prospect of a, a catharsis or a, a redemption. And then maybe, just maybe, it might help to avert that combination of circumstances that led to that that overall tragedy and all of the individual tragedies of which of which the tragedy of the mother and baby homes is is, is made up uh, to prevent what the american pastor and social commentator chris hedges um, refers to as historical amnesia so to prevent historical amnesia and just to close out i just wonder in relation to the the real reason the proximal reason one of them at least for the closure of those mother and baby home files um uh, apart from exposure to potential litigation uh i just wonder uh, is it um, is it to ensure that uh given what we know in in the public domain now um about the conduct of trials um on orphan children and on other children in the mother and baby homes uh with with various products including pharmaceuticals and early early forms of early iterations, as we would say, of infant formula uh, and various other things, is the real reason uh, for the closure of the files, the sealing of the files, um, to ensure that anything that, that might undo what, uh, what I might call uh, the carefully crafted, the, the engineered sentiment towards uh, pharmaceutical interventions for COVID-19, is that the real proximal reason uh, because anything that which would create that negative sentiment is to be avoided at all costs. OK, uh, David, a lot to unpack there in that summing up, as always, uh, uh, Peter. Um, you, you've done um, an amazing summary. You've pulled all the various strands together. And for that, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful, Peter. Um, 
I'd also like to say a very special thanks to Barbara Scanlon. Barbara is the spokesperson for the Alliance of Birth Mothers Campaigning for Justice. And um, Barbara works tires, tirelessly on behalf of mothers whose children have been taken by TUSLA. I know that she's dedicated to it seven days a week from early morning until late at night. And um, I have no hesitation in saying that there is at least a half dozen mothers that I personally know that are alive today because of Barbara's intervention. So Barbara, thank you so much. Um, and very special thanks to David Kinsler, um, who taught us his story there of being born and raised in a mother and baby home and his efforts to try and find out who his birth mother was, sadly too late to meet her this side of the grave. I'd also like and to pay is it okay to say something, man? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I meant to say as well, uh, um, uh, while I was going through all that detox and uh, substance abuse, um, I did have suicidal ideation and, uh, as well. But what, what I really want to mention is, there's, uh, it, it can be easily downloaded on Google. There's, uh, of all the stuff I've researched, um, there's, a, there's an article by a lady called Wendy Jacobs, The Consequences of Separating Mother and Child at Birth. And this, uh, um, this would apply in all categories, like, you know, um, it's 23 pages long. It's highly academic, but very, very, it's easily readable. And page eight, anyone that, that, that looks her up, page eight will actually shock you. Of uh, The research was done in St Kilda over in Australia in, in, the 19, in the late 1990s. And a Jesuit priest was concerned about the amount of suicides in St Kilda. So when Wendy Jacobs, the academic, did the research and our findings, and that was of 147 suicides over a 10 year period, 140, 142 all came from adoption backgrounds. That, 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 that's a truly staggering uh, statistic. Thank you so much for that, David. And I suppose it's very relevant to ABC. I would also like to pay tribute to Mary, um, the mother whose baby was taken last year and who is struggling to get access uh, to her baby and also uh, to be reunited uh, with, her, with, with her child. Finally, a big thanks to Stephen Kerr and his team at the Irish Inquiry who have made this live stream possible. And as I said at the outset, um, uh, Stephen is expanding the Irish Inquiry tomorrow night. We have a wonderful live stream coming up at 10 o'clock. Uh, it's introduced by um, Dr. Finn Bar Markey. It will be the third programme. Uh, I've watched the other two um, not to be missed. And uh, next week, I know that it, uh, Stephen has other programmes in the pipeline as well. But a huge amount of work mm -hmm. goes into preparing a live stream like this. So I want to pay tribute to Stephen. And if there's anybody out there that has uh, any kind of skills that can help us, please go to the Irish Inquiry website, to the drop down box, help us, and you can send your details to Stephen that way. To those of you who have been watching, tonight's programme has been very, very harrowing. Um, I, I just find these stories deeply, deeply disturbing. Uh, they are stories that the mainstream media will not touch. I have tried in vain um, to try and get um, mainstream media, and by, by mainstream media, I, I mean broadcast media, to, to cover some of these stories, and they have refused. I, I wonder why. You can help us by sharing these videos to get word out that the state abuse of birth mothers and their children is an unbroken chain that continues right to the present day. It beholds all of us to break that chain because if we don't, future generations will never forgive us. Until we meet again next Wednesday evening at eight o'clock.
Bannock today or if Galair. Ihoa.